right, everybody, welcome to the session. Um, if you are here for one trigger tool to rule them all, excellent. First step is complete successfully. Um, my name is Elle McKay, um, and I work for Cloud for Good. And the best part of this, the statement looks forward. Make all your purchasing decisions based on available products. All right, like I said, my name is Elle McKay. I enjoy laughing, I enjoy double IPA in the sun, things like that. Um, that is my email, that is my uh, Twitter, I think. Uh, feel free to follow that if you really enjoy inappropriate bumper stickers or street art or anything about Elle Michaels because I love Elle Michaels. He is the best sportscaster ever, period, okay. So I probably should have brought a clicker, but I didn't, so I'm gonna get my steps in today. So today what we're gonna talk about um, is that trigger tool to rule them all. We're gonna start out with a little bit of a background on NPSP and HEDA, or EDA, pardon me. Um, who here has worked with the nonprofit cloud? Nice, okay, about half-ish. And then how about the education cloud? All right, same people, excellent. Um, okay, so. All of this obviously pertains to those packages, but it also can be referenced um, as a design pattern on the platform outside of these packages. So some of the links that I have at the end of this and additional resources um, has links to the GitHub packages so that you can reference that source code uh, because it is open source. So these will be, the slides will be available, um, I believe, sometime after the session. Um, gonna not accept that call. Um, <clears throat> Buying a house with my wife, we um, were actually new foster parents and we just ran out of room. Um, thank you. Uh, and so that, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. I feel like I have a little more appreciation about parenting, um, a lot more. So anyway, that was um, my uh, loan broker, so I will definitely get back to her after this, but I will try not to rush. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about MPSP and EDA. And then we're gonna talk about TDTM, which is secretly what this is all about. Then I'm gonna go through a demonstration, um, a live demonstration, unless we have technical difficulties, and then I'm gonna show you a really cool recording of what I did earlier. Uh, so fingers crossed that works. And then I'm gonna just provide you all with some kind of heads up in terms of if you wanna dig into this uh, more deeply, just some things to keep in mind to guide you um, and also just some kind of warnings about uh, being careful. And then next we'll go over the additional resources, um, which come from a variety of sources, but basically all the best stuff that I found to educate myself about TDTM. And then if we have time, we will have some Q&A. <clears throat> all right, so for a little bit of background, um, for those of you that have not used MPSP or EDA, so there are two packages, uh, they're distinct. One is Nonprofit Cloud or the Nonprofit Success Pack. It used to be called Nonprofit Starter Pack. Um, I don't think it's called anything else yet, but so those are all interchangeable. MPSP, Nonprofit Cloud is talking about that package. That package um, actually contains five packages when you do an install, um, and that's just really so that you understand that it's not just one single package, because these represent different pieces of functionality in NPSP, and there is a lot of powerful stuff there. I, um, I really got serious about using NPSP about almost two years ago uh, when I joined Cloud for Good, and I, as I brought myself up to speed on NPSP, um, one of the best parts was I had been on the platform for so many years, I didn't really get into that. I got in on the platform about 11 years ago working in local government um, and sustainability in Portland. Uh, fell in love with the platform, um, kind of did everything that I could with it there, and kind of became like a non-commissioned Salesforce salesperson because I would just talk everybody at the city's ear off about this. Um, eventually got the mayor's office to adopt it, which you may have seen in scenes from Portlandia. Uh, little plug there, um, it's, it's all pretty much true, even the weird, weird stuff. Um, and so my whole point of that is that I'd been on the platform for so long and then I got into NPSP and 
I got to experience some of that initial joy again of using Salesforce, like some of this functionality, um, affiliations, the household account model, they are just really cool things that happen natively on the platform through this open source code that has been put together um, with .org, but then also a bunch of folks uh, in the community. They hold um, two or three open sprints each year where people can come to whatever city it's in and we identify what we're struggling with, what the how the platform could improve with MPSP or EDA, and then we literally sit down and start building and changing um, and writing documentation. So it's very much a, a living package, much like EDA. Um, so that's Education Cloud, it used to be called HEDA, uh, now it's EDA. Uh, I'm hoping, hoping it doesn't go like to duh, so we'll stick with EDA, EDA for now. Um, there is a newer package that's related called Gift Entry Manager, and so if you hear Gem around, it's it's not Gemstones, it's Gift Entry Manager, and that's uh, that's actually some pretty cool functionality that some of our higher ed customers are now um, getting to use. So the last thing that I wanted to mention is the Power of Us Hub. This is the success community for folks using um, NPSP, um, folks in education, nonprofits. Uh, it's I, I honestly probably visit it at least once a day because, again, I can post questions, I can look up articles, um, tons of members. It's, it's very much like a living, breathing resource. So absolutely get in there if you haven't used MPSP or EDA and you're curious. If you're not curious, do it, because then you'll realize you were curious and you didn't realize it. Okay, so let's talk about why you're all really here, and that is TDTM, and that stands for Table Driven Trigger management. That's great. But what is table-driven trigger management besides a really great name? So it's a tool that allows you to manage your Apex code in terms of how it behaves in either of those packages. So right now, it's not a standalone uh, product. It's just part of that open source uh, base code in MPSP and EDA. Um, it utilizes essentially a custom object called a trigger handler object, and then using a trigger, and ideally one trigger per object, that's the, that's the best practice, that's the one trigger to rule them all, um, which I clearly stole for this clever title, um, and then classes to provide um, all that control over your Apex code. So these three things really work together to allow you to control how your code behaves, and so things don't fire uh, indeterminately um, on whatever object somebody is working on. I would like you to think about it as your automation destination, station, relation, like that. All right, where can I find it? So if you do uh, install MPSP or EDA um, in like a dev org or something, you would just go um, up to NPSP settings. I realize this is very small, um, but it's just a tab there. And you visit there, and then you uh, go system tools, and then trigger configuration. And that is where we get to see all of the trigger handler records that come out of the box with NPSP or EDA, depending again on which package. So from here, you can create new trigger handler records. Um, but you can't edit existing ones. And so to do that, we're gonna get into that in a little bit. Uh, but here's where you can see all of them in one place. So let's talk about the trigger handler record itself. Here is the anatomy. Uh, the trigger handler name is ideally not something as catchy as this one. Um, then we name the class that we are going to be referencing. And then we also name the object that this, uh, this class relates to. And then we determine the action, the trigger action. We can choose one or more of these. And then we select load order. So this is essentially what happens is, say we're on the contact object and there is a TDTM trigger on the contact object. When somebody is editing or inserting or doing one of these wonderful things with a contact record, um, this is what determines which order in which this Apex class essentially is called from that trigger. And again, we're gonna get more into this and how this operates. I just want you to understand the basics of what this looks like. Um, you might have noticed in that tiny picture, oh no, that was the, no, sorry. Let me just go back. Oh, the big reveal, totally ruined. <laughs> okay, 
So what you probably can't see very well is that load order, you can have the same number on multiple trigger handler records. That just means that they can, they can fire in whatever order that they happen to happen in. Um, so you would say, so this is a best practice. You would want all of the native um, trigger handler records to fire before your custom apex, and so that would then be two, three, four, things like that. But that's just something that puzzled me when I first saw this. I was like, load order, they're all the same number. Like, that's, what? Okay, wrapping this up. After that, we've got the active checkbox. Hopefully that um, speaks for itself. Um, we've got asynchronous after events. And then we've got user managed. So the user managed field is important because that is how you signify if this trigger handler record is being um, used. Um, in terms of you're editing it, you're making changes to it. If you don't check that and then updates get pushed um, into your org, it could reset what that was. So this is, in a good example, this would be one of the out of the box trigger handlers. So if you make changes to it, which be careful with that, uh, you're gonna wanna check that user manage box so it doesn't revert to its default behavior. Finally, we have usernames to exclude. So this is really cool because it allows you to call out a username um, to basically have an exception to this trigger handler firing. So if you had, say, like an integration user or a test user, you could go ahead and put those usernames in there, and then those would be excluded from this firing. That was a lot of information um, for something that a lot of you probably have never seen before. So my ruined big reveal is that uh, I'm a nerd and I love Game of Thrones. Um, I figure this is a safe place for this conversation. Um, I am thinking that this is gonna provide a middling analogy for TDTM. So I want you to think about TDTM as a framework for managing uh, Westeros, leveraging the small council. Um, so here is our example of a small council. Um, thank you, HBO. And over there, we've got the map of Westeros. So one thing to call out here is that is worth Googling, Westeros map, because there is some crazy stuff out there. People love Game of Thrones way more than me. Um, also, I didn't know that Dorne was a foot. You know, I thought it was an island. So this actually helped me understand the story so much better. Okay. So there's gonna be no spoilers here. If you haven't read the books, if you haven't watched the show, um, I'm not ruining anything for you. In fact, I'm very envious of you. So this is all first season, first book stuff, so don't worry, don't close your eyes. Um, in this analogy, we're gonna have Salesforce MPSP be the Westeros management system, and that's copyrighted, so sorry. Uh, we got our objects, so these are gonna be represented by King Robert's portfolio, um, as represented by a small council member. So by portfolio, I mean, um, so a mayor and a city council would have a portfolio that included the police department, uh, the fire department, bureau of planning, things like that. And so each one of those was a portfolio item. And so this small council member each has one of those items, such as coin for uh, Littlefinger, uh, war, things like that. So the apex triggers are gonna be represented by the small council members themselves. Um, Apex classes are going to be the actions of the small council members, based on logic, or lack thereof, uh, and trigger handlers. This is going to really be at the heart of King Robert's power when we talk about how these relate to one another. Okay, and just to really go one more level down, because this was really fun to look up, uh, we've got our objects on the far side. So kingdoms, those are accounts. Subjects, those are really contacts. Wars, we're gonna, you know, the, we're gonna use the campaign object. Um, I did customize an org with all of this, but it was a trial org and I let it expire, so you're not gonna see that one. Um, lesson learned. Uh, so we've got all these. We've got the title of the person who is in charge of it. Um, I maester stuff, that one was difficult. If you have any ideas with what object that would be, I would love to hear it. What was that? Documentation. Knowledge. 
I like knowledge, thank you. Where were you yesterday? All right, let's talk about really the highlights of TDTM. So there's three main things that make this such a powerful tool. It disables specific pieces of code. It allows you to do that. Um, it also allows you to build custom code that works within the nonprofit and education clouds. And then it also allows you to control the order in which code executes. And that's what I've touched on so far. So let's dig into each of these a little bit further. All right, our first one, TDTM and King Robert, one and the same. So with TDTM, you get to disable specific Apex classes. So this, this is very much like King Robert in that he has veto power. He can you know, suspend an action. Um, he basically does whatever he wants. He can cancel plans. Uh, it's kind of his, uh, it's his jam to just be impulsive. So getting into the details of disabling specific pieces of code, you might wonder like, why do you wanna do that? The code is there to do its job. Let's let it do its job. Let's not overcomplicate the relationship. But it can really come in handy. Um, so these are three examples of when it is the most helpful. Um, so when you're doing an integration with more, one or more external systems, um, this could be, this was what I was talking about earlier, um, where you might wanna exclude the username of an integration user because you don't necessarily want your code firing um, with, that, with that integration. Um, another one, which is the one that I deal with most often, is when you're importing large data sets, like thousands of records. Um, say you've got that data in a format that's just ready to roll, like you've got your contacts and the accounts you wanna create off that, so on and so forth. You don't want necessarily to have these, um, to have these triggers and all this code firing to then automatically create those records for you in Salesforce because we don't really need to bog down the system with that if you can do that as just part of the migration. So that will save, that will save you some time and heartache. Um, and then lastly, it can really be helpful in terms of investigating and solving Apex errors, just being able to drill down, um, figure out what exactly is causing the problem. So you can disable code for all users or specific users. We talked about that earlier. Um, and you can also disable it um, via code during the exe execution of Apex. All right, second highlight. These are peas in a pod. Control the order in which Apex code executes. So this is like King Robert and that he controls the order in which things occur. Um, he can have Littlefinger pay for a tournament um, before he really talks to Tywin about borrowing all that gold. Uh, he, really, he really determines the order in which things happen. So getting a little bit more into this. Um, so the, the gap right now is that we have trigger classes, um, but we can't necessarily control the order in which um, things fire. And so if we have a single trigger on each object um, and we've got several um, classes that, that relate, we can't right now, there's this gap where we can't control which class fires first. So the example that I hear a lot is, say you have code that helps you get dressed in the morning. So if you can't order that code, you might end up with like your jeans on, your underwear over that, socks over your shoes. So it's important to be able to call out what should happen and in which order so that all this code you've spent time developing is actually doing what you want it to do in that specified order. So in more simple orgs, um, this isn't something you necessarily need to worry about. It's something that as you grow in complexity, it's something to absolutely uh, consider just because, again, it helps you to be more thoughtful and more efficient in what you're doing. Okay, last one. Building custom code that works directly with NPSP or EDA. So like King Robert, it creates, he creates new actions such as throwing himself giant parties. Uh, he makes people the hand, he orders uh, hits on Daenerys, resends hits on Daenerys, things like that. I wish he could be here for the session today. That would just be so perfect. Okay, so when it comes to building your own code, um, and I've touched on this already, it's very important to observe that best practice of one trigger on each object. Um, I've seen in orgs that are especially complicated and you know, developers have come and gone that there's multiple triggers, which really just is a tangled mess that should be untangled. Uh, this actually allows you to 
to have that single trigger and again, maintain all of that control. Um, so you really only need to write Apex classes and then that data gets um, passed on to those classes through the existing triggers. Um, and if there's not a trigger for an object you're working on, either a standard one or a custom one, it's actually very straightforward to build one using the TDTM framework that you can then uh, take advantage of to use this. Okay, so I'm gonna show you just a real quick demo of what I'm talking about here. Okay, so here's my org. Here's my much less exciting org. I only really have the Iron Throne. Um, so we'll go over to contacts. Oh, good. Is it this one? Okay. Password. All one word. Thank you. I love an interactive session. Okay. I had a feeling I was forgetting something. Hmm. There we go. Security first. One moment here. I definitely don't have enough orgs in my life. Voila. Make this a wee bit bigger. Okay, so we've got Balon Greyjoy, the charmer he is. We have his basic record here. Um, we have that he is the Lord of the Iron Islands. Um, he belongs to the Greyjoy household. In my prior super nerded out version, it was House Greyjoy. It was so great. Uh, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna create an Apex class and I'm gonna create a test class, and then I'm gonna create a trigger handler record so that you can just see briefly from a high level how they differ in terms of just how you would normally write an Apex class. So to do this, I'm just gonna open up Dev Console. And I'm gonna create an Apex class. And I have already, um, I already have these ready because I figured you did not want to see me type these. So let's plug these in real quick. So the purpose of this is really to say when a contact is added to a new campaign, then a field on the contact object is automatically updated to show the most recent campaign that that person has responded to. Okay. So here is, here's a class. So let me just call out a couple of things. So we've got right here, we've called out um, the TDTM runnable for the interface. And then we have this global override um, with the DML wrapper. And then we have this section down here um, where we are essentially creating these lists. And then we have basically what you're used to, which is just right in here. So we're gonna save that, and I'm gonna just create the test record because we should always have coverage. And then we will create a trigger handler record, and then we'll see it work. Perfect. Using a little Aegon Targaryen for our, our test data here. So that's done, we've added those. Let's get rid of that. Uh, so I showed you earlier how to get to the list of trigger handler records, that was through MPSP settings. And we can go in there and we can create a new trigger handler record. But what I did was I, I created a custom tab and provided myself the requisite access, created a list view so that we could just see all these uh, in a much more clear way. 
because this is what you have to do in order to be able to edit out of the box uh, trigger handler records. Um, so here we can make them active or inactive. Um, we can change the load order. Again, I would just be very careful with changing anything out of the box with MPSP because it is very trigger heavy and all of this is by design. Um, but when you do add new trigger handler records, you can do it through here. So here we're gonna call out the object. Here's where we listed that class that we just created. So this one is gonna be after insert and after update. So again, I can select multiples of those. I'm just gonna choose a load order of two because I know that there's a bunch of out of the box um, trigger handler records that are already gonna run on the contact. I'm not gonna exclude any usernames. Um, I do want it to be active. I'm gonna mark it again as user managed. and because I'm anal retentive, there we go. All right, so now we've got our record, it was that easy. So now we're just gonna go back over to our campaigns. Um, let's actually look at Balon one more time and we'll look at his related campaign. So he's on the Greyjoy Rebellion, of course. So let's just add him to one more. Let's add him to the War of the Five Kings say that he responded, not in a flattering manner. And then we're gonna just go back to campaigns, contacts. Uh, we're gonna open his record back up and just going to refresh his record here. Oh. I'm gonna refresh it one more time. I'm not gonna make you watch me figure this out. All right, so what this is supposed to do um, is not leave me hanging. Um, so it's supposed to fill in this little uh, field right here called most recent responded campaign, and that should be the War of the Five Kings because that is the last one that I added him to. So before we move forward, I'm just gonna check one thing real quick. Oh, that's right, thank you. You win the prize for paying attention. Ah, uh, thank you, member. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, I'm just gonna add him to one more. And then thanks to that guy, this is gonna work. You're my co-presenter. All right, so I've added him to another campaign, so we're just gonna go back and take a look at his record. And there it is. So most recent responded campaign, and in this case, we're thinking war. So what I wanted to show you there was just how those interact. We have the one trigger on the contact, and then we have the Apex class, and then we have the trigger handler record. Okay, let's wrap this up. Some things to keep in mind. Not every object in Salesforce has a TDTM trigger. It's about 20 of them. Um, there's a list there. Uh, you can also add a trigger, which I mentioned before. Um, you can create a trigger just using a very um, few simple lines of code. Um, to, trigger, to edit trigger handler records, which I showed you, you have to add that tab, uh, make some permission changes, um, and then also, this is only available via uh, NPSP and EDA, but you can reference those design patterns and there are some GitHub uh, links in here. And then lastly, trigger handler records are technically data and so they don't move to a sandbox. This is something one of uh, my colleagues was pointing out the other day. And so if you happen to be do using these and you are moving you know, through a sandbox, just you know, when your hair catches fire because you don't see them, this is why. So very easy to, uh, to account for. All right, so the reason I did this presentation um, 
was initially for a different conference because I was very curious about TDTM and I felt totally overwhelmed by it and I didn't feel like there was a lot of good information out there. And so I went through everything that I could find online. Here's the, here are the resources that's um, on the Power of Us Hub, which there is really great documentation and it's getting updated all the time as they make constant changes to things. Um, and I just, I had a really good time figuring it out. Um, and so I figured why not get even better at it uh, by helping to teach other people because this is such a cool tool that so few people end up knowing about. One last additional resources here. Um, these are all fantastic. Um, that GitHub repository, so MPSP on GitHub goes under, uh, goes by Cumulus and then EDA goes by EDA, but you can visit um, either of those packages and you can find references to TDTM if you want to dig in and um, just try to customize that in your own org that doesn't have uh, MPSP or EDA. All right, that was it. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you. Thank you for the gentleman that spotted my silly mistake. Um, yes. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Um, you can either email me or you can talk to me right now. Um, either works.